I, I guess those of you who've been to prior C3 workshops and have heard me say this before, but I mean, uh, you know, I've known Neil forever, it seems, and uh, uh, I mean, you well know her as uh, you know, uh, her work in network coding and, and wireless communications, and being a mentor in this area, and she builds a community wherever she goes. It's really fantastic what she can do in our way. And then, and, and then uh, now we'd like to do uh, just a, a wonderful colleague. And, uh, and now we're, we're going to hear about, so I guess, uh, well, go ahead. Uh, never a retrospective. Thank you very much, Don. Thanks, Yosa, for inviting me. And um, so, yes, and also thanks to Ken, because I was going to give a, a dry talk. You will be spared even the title. And he suggested instead I give a, a retrospective, and it seemed about about the right time um, as, as things are approaching. So uh, uh, 20 years of, of network coding. And uh, as Sean mentioned, we were colleagues together with Shrikant, which, and, and both, both Sean and Shrikant just were so complex Absolutely wonderful to me as, as a junior faculty taking me on and, and, and mentoring me. Um, I always have uh, this slide about all my wonderful collaborators, some of them are here, um, but uh, much of what I'm going to talk about today is actually Ralph uh, Cutter, who was also a colleague with us at University of Illinois and who's the friend of Sean who never got to come to a friend of Sean um, uh, meeting. Um, so this is a little bit of the overview of the different things I'm going to talk about today. Uh, and it looks uh, a bit like a, uh, a disjointed archipelago uh, sort of uh, a set of themes. Um, and actually, I was going to put something about this, and I, I ended up picking it out. So apologies, it's, it's, it's still in there. Um, but the idea here was uh, to give you, as I mentioned, a retrospective about one of the ways that uh, the research in network coding came about and, and right now as I'll talk about at the end of the, um, the, um, the presentation uh, it is really now in the um, um, commercial phase we, we are pushing this into into commercial applications and I'll mention some of them and so that also seemed like a, a good time to, to, to sort of sit back and see how it came about okay so um, I was uh, working happily in network resilience uh, when I started at, at Illinois as a background as an information theorist, uh, but I had gone severely, severely down market into, you know, what we're talking about, massively uh, mundane um, engineering, or so it was seen, uh, looking at optical network resilience and looking at data centers. And we heard about data centers this morning. It's fashionable now. It certainly was not fashionable at the end, at the, at the end of the 90s. It was really quite, um, uh, like I said, very down market. Um, and from there, I started talking uh, to, to Ralph uh, and went into algebraic network coding. I mean, what, what, uh, what joined us uh, thematically was was um, that we were both information theorists, even though we had uh, very, very different um, types of approaches. I had a more sort of Shannon theory approach, and he had more a uh, coding theory approach, uh, you know, really algebraic approach. Um, and from there, how things started on the very theory side, so you see this kind of uh, vague abscissa on the bottom, is from you know, theory to practice, went to much more practical things, from much more practical code constructions to protocols, from more theoretical protocols to implemented protocols, and, uh, and so on and so forth. So that's what I'm going to talk about. So uh, please forgive me, because I know that many people in this room actually are specialists in coding, but I thought, given that this is a fairly uh, mixed audience, that it might be worthwhile just to give the, uh, the cartoon version of what is coding. Uh, so we really have sort of two sources, uh, two sorts of coding, roughly. This is, you know, the kind of the rough binary taxonomy. One is source coding, like you, know, you use, say, gzip, uh, and what that does is that it removes redundancy. Uh, generally for efficient storage or efficient representation of some sort. And the other one, which is ca channel coding, which actually introduces redundancy uh, for reliability against whatever deleterious effects, say, the channel or other transmission medium has. And all of these are point to point. So you, you, you know, for, with some notable exceptions, which I'll talk about, you sort of you code at the source um, first to shrink your data representation, then you code to have some reliability because something's going to happen to you with the channel, and then you decode at the end, and that's basically how things work. And 
of course, when we have a network, the question is, you know, wh what do I do? And there is a field of network information theory. It's a well-established field, um, but it's also a very subtle field with mostly uh, results about how things, uh, how hard things are. I mean, if you look at things like the the classical relay channel, not to go too much into what it is, but you have three nodes and it's not solved. Now, normally, you know, if you're a grad student, you look at a field where people don't know how to solve three node systems, you sort of would go look for something else to do. Uh, but no, not, not, not in information theory, just keep going. Um, because it's so much fun. But the idea here is, you know, how can you take these sorts of ideas and introduce them into an entire network moving away from the point-to-point -point system. And one of the things I'm going to come back towards the, the latter half of the talk is also how do we mix these two types of notion of what we do on channels and what we do on a network. Um, so if this is the very simple taxonomy, uh, this is the very simple um, evolution of coding. So, um, 1948, um, Shannon's paper comes out on, on basically a capacity and really introducing the field of information theory such as we think of it nowadays. Uh, and very soon there are codes that are developed in order to make up the errors, the, the channel codes that I talked about. Uh, block codes, many of them still in wide use today, so things like read salmon codes, convolutional codes, very similar to block codes still. Uh, basically just algebraic mappings but using polynomials in delay rather than just uh, matrices. Uh, there's a lot of, there's sort of a flurry of uh, compression, um, uh, compression um, developments uh, in the 70s. Uh, Lempel Ziv, I talked about GZIP. GZIP is very close to Lempel Ziv. It's very much akin to that. So lossless compression, everything's perfect. Um, and then some theoretical developments about uh, distributed compression where you have not one source but several sources and how can you compress without any coordination among different nodes and the very interesting result by Slep and Wolf, which seems almost, which is certainly counterintuitive and seems almost impossible, is that you can do as well rate wise in terms of compression without coordination as you can with. Okay, so uh, in the 1990s, Turbo Codes, uh, Beru Glavier and Titi Majima uh, published on Turbo Codes, are widely derided as being, as being nuts, are then widely celebrated as being right. Uh, and then, um, you know, the point of these codes is you're not quite sure how to decode them, but heck, you, you do. You know, in practice, they, they just decode all the time. Uh, and at that point, people then rediscover low density parity check codes. So I'm putting low density parity check codes in the 90s, even though they appear in the 60s because they appeared in the 60s but you know if a train if um, if um, if you if a tree falls in a forest and no one hears it what did it you know what what happens so, so basically this was Bob Gallagher's um, PhD thesis nobody f could figure out what the heck he was trying to do uh, it looked good but uh, you know it, it sounded insane and so you know just 10 years off patent, people rediscovered them. Okay, yeah, exactly. Uh, Readless codes, uh, things like um, uh, Raptor codes and other codes for, uh, for um, usually for file downloads, you know, which have been um, uh, popularized or you know certainly pushed by, by Qualcomm and then network codes uh, and really what happened in network codes is sort of the simplest version of network coding really came out uh, I would say in the mid 90s it wasn't called that way there was just a, a very cute little example in a, in a paper by Raymond Young he didn't call it a network code but now we would recognize it as such um, Simultaneously, and I would say pretty much in, uh, in uh, also in obscurity, uh, Robert Lee at the Chinese University of Hong Kong was writing a book on switching. Uh, he took many, many years from his life to write a book on switching. Um, and it's called An Algebraic Theory of Switching. And even though there's no coding in it, the spirit was there. Um, and he's, uh, he's really a remarkable man. He's, uh, his father was a very well-known Chinese poet, and he said, you know, he'd learn from his father. His father would just go to the mountains and just hang out all day and come back. He had like one verse, and he thought, you know, this is a good day's work. And Bob is the same type of guy. He just made this beautiful masterpiece, which did not have coding, but really had this inspiration. So, um, uh, there were... I was at uh, at Illinois, and it was Bruce Hayek actually who suggested 
to, to Ralph and me that we look at this paper from, uh, uh, from Chinese University of Hong Kong uh, and from Beale Field University, so the late Rudy Osvede uh, and uh, Raymond Young and Ning Tsai, who is now at Xi'an University. Um, and, uh, you know, it was, it was they, they had been submitted, there had been some issues, they had been revised, and, you know, it was kind of. Uh, uh, just being circulated, and it was Bruce who suggested to Ralph and me that, that we look at it. Um, and uh, not only, so this was 99, we were both brand new uh, faculty members being uh, kindly mentored, uh, and, and both of us were um, uh, a little bit outsiders. Uh, he was, I think it's, it's fair to say Ralph was an outsider because he certainly did not come from the let's say the usual background of uh, faculty members at top universities in the US. He had gotten his PhD from Linköping University, which most people could not pronounce. Uh, and it, you know, it's like not even the main university in, um, in um, Sweden. Uh, but you know, there were a few people who had recognized that he was completely brilliant. I, of course, had a much more uh, normal uh, CV, you know, I came from MIT, I was a student of Bob Gallagher, but as I said, I was doing this really down market stuff that, you know, I would go give talks on this and people, you know, this was like one step up from changing your tire, and I mind you, I don't know how to change a tire, so, you know, for me, <laughs> that, that would already be good, but I mean, you know, it was, it was really considered sort of very grimy engineering. Um, at the time. Okay, so the, the, the principle of coding, as I said, you have first compression, so you take data, you make it into a smaller uh, representation, you then, you know, it looks like it's goofy because first you shrink it, then you stretch it, but it's not the same stretching, that's why it has different colors, unless you're maybe colorblind and the, maybe choosing red and green wasn't such a good idea. Uh, but you, you add redundancy, but you add a different kind of redundancy in an intelligent way to sort of uh, predict what's, um, what may happen in the in the network, uh, let's just say right now in the point-to-point -point link. Uh, then you go through the channel, as I mentioned, the data gets corrupted in some way, maybe it gets erased, uh, maybe it gets changed, uh, and then at the, at the receiver, this corrupted data is, uh, is reconstructed through the channel decoding, and then it's uh, recovered to the source decoding, okay? All right. So uh, I was working, as I mentioned, even though I had the background as, as an information theorist and I was doing information theory, I was, I was working in this very down market field uh, of uh, optical network resilience. I'm particularly looking at redundancy. And what people were doing is um, they were setting up paths across the network uh, and trying to get some good level of uh, diversity among these paths while not having to pay too much for the resources used by the paths. Um, so if you have a background in information theory, you know that this is an instance of repetition coding, and repetition coding is as it sounds. You say something twice, and you didn't hear it on the first pass, you heard it on the second path. So, you know, there's a reason why this is down market. Um, and the, the first thing that, um, uh, that, that Ralph and I started thinking about is, you know, can we use coding as a, reli a reliability mechanism in networks, and in particular, can we take say a very specific protocol, which um, at the time was Sonnet for optical networks, so maybe for some of the people in the room you, you know this as um, uh, SDH uh, for what was being used in Europe and, and Asia. And can we map it to a code? And we decided that if we could do that, if we could show that that was a code, we would go ahead and spend a, you know, at least one year working on it. So that was kind of our, our initial thing. And what we saw is that routing, where each node maps an input port to an output port, switching in effect, is a special case of, case of coding with binary one zero coefficients. Again, going back to Bob Lee's book on algebraic switching theory, it's kind of there, but he never says that then you could generalize it, right? But in hindsight, you, you can see it. Um, so since he was a coding theorist, in particular an algebraic coding theorist, um, we started thinking of this as, as a transfer matrix. And the idea, for instance, here is you know, have a network, and I'm trying to send two pieces of data, x1 and x2, uh, across the network. Uh, so this looks like one of uh, uh, Shrikan's, uh, these, these nodes here would be like your perceptrons, except here the function I'm trying to recover, the identity function, okay, so this is a lot simpler. Uh, so we're trying to recover the identity function across this network. 
Uh, and the idea is I can do the edge incidence matrix of that network, so I call it F, and I basically have zeros everywhere except in the spots where one edge is incident upon another edge. So you see beta E1, E3 means that edge E1 is incidence upon edge E3. Okay, so how do I get from the left to the right? Well, I could draw all the different paths. I could say I could go E1 to E3, E3 to E5, I could go E1 to E4, and so on. Or I can take that F, uh, and I can just say that I can take one step, two steps, three steps, and so on. So basically, if I do that, what I get is I can stay where I am, or I can go one hop, two hops, etc. Now, of course, here, eventually this F becomes nil potent. You can modify these things so that you have loops and it's not nil potent, but then you need to have delays and you need to have a polynomial in D. Think of the whole network then just working like a feedback shift register, in effect, you know, if you're, if you're an electrical engineer. But all we're doing here is summing path gains. So what we're saying is, you know, if you assume that you have linear mappings, so uh, B beta E1, E3 is the ponderating, um, it's a ponderating factor of the contribution from edge 1 onto edge E3, and beta E1, E4 is a ponderating factor of edge E1 to edge e, e, E4, then you can see that the product of beta E1, E3, beta E3, E5 is the combined ponderation when you go E1 to E3, E3 to E5. Okay. So this was, you know, in many ways very simple, but then what it meant is that the, the structure uh, all of a sudden became fairly manageable. And in particular, we started, uh, there, there was a lot of ability then to do proofs, as we were calling it, proofs by crayon, which is basically, suppose that I have uh, three, three variables, I have some network, and it's going to be multicast, meaning that all three receivers, the blue, red, and yellow receiver, all want to recover the same axis, the same triple of axis here. So Z1, 1, Z should be X1, Z1, 2 should be X2, Z1, 3 should be X3, and the same thing at each of those, okay? And who knows what mess there is. So what do we have? We have three inputs here, and we have nine outputs. And then I have the matrix representing the network. It's some ruddy mess, who knows what it is. And then I have the receiver matrix. And my receiver matrix, the way it works is you see this block here corresponds to the blue receiver. And he doesn't get to talk to the red or the yellow receiver. These, these guys are not cooperating. This is the red receiver and the yellow receiver. And what each of these is trying to do is they're trying to invert the effect of the channel because we're just trying to get the identity vis-a-vis -vis the inputs. The channel is now, of course, just a whole network, but it's a, it's a linear filter. So what do I need? I need each of these to be invertible, each of these three by three matrices. And in order for that to happen, it has to be that I can look at these betas and have polynomials, each corresponding to the determinant of the blue, the red, and the yellow. Each of those determinants had better be non-zero. Okay, now if I only had the blue, if I didn't worry about the red and the yellow, it turns out I never needed to pick the betas to be anything other than zero or one. Which means if I have a single source and a single receiver, I can just get away with routing. And as long as the minimum cut of the network is equal to the maximum, f is, 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 is greater than or equal to the maximum flow that I'm trying to send, it works. That's Ford Fulkerson. But now I need it to be f feasible not just in one of them, but in all three of them. So what I may need to do because I have more receivers is I may need to bump up my field size because I need to make sure that I don't pick a beta here which might be appropriate for say the red matrix but be a root in the polynomial corresponding to the determinant of the yellow matrix. That's it. It's that simple. 
So now all of a sudden the types of sort of complicated graph theoretic things that people were trying to do by you know overlaying Steiner trees and all those sorts of things really just fell apart. This is that just that simple. And you could do a lot of proofs of this nature. The only thing that I mean needed to do is to have more choice and representations, you needed to go up in field size. So we had to move away from binary, had to move away from routing, but it also meant that we didn't have competition for network resources among different receivers, completely different from the way things were being done using trees for routing, completely different. Um, and in particular, one of the things that it meant is that if I'm looking at how to pick these betas so that I have non-zero determinants, say for the yellow, the blue, and the red, how do I pick the betas? Well, I could of course try to coordinate and do something smart, or if I'm going to allow myself to go up in field size, I can be completely dumb, go to a large enough field size, and just choose them uniformly, randomly, independently, at each and every node. Because in effect, all I need to do is to avoid roots. I don't have that many roots. So if I have a large enough field, I just choose randomly, the chances that I fall on the root are very small. And of course people use this all the time in randomized algorithms and indeed it's very closely linked to bipartite matching problem. So it's very much the same solution. You know, we first mapped it to a bipartite matching problem actually to, to do this. Um, and you know, I'll do one little thing. I mentioned Steppenwolf distributed source coding. It turns out that you do actually uh, achieve this distributed source coding separate wolf using random uh, coding and you can use the same coding here so basically the idea is that Sepin wolf was already a network code nobody thought of it that way there was no reason but it was of depth one and this L just like you had L in your, in your talk sure you can't this L is the length of the network it's the depth of the network and um, you know you, you get expressions, and this is the only time I'm going to show something icky that I probably shouldn't have shown. I think it's the only time. But you get expressions which were basically the same expressions that we knew about random coding for Sepian Wolf that we knew since the 80s from Chazar, except he just didn't have this. He just didn't have a depth of the network because his network depth happened to be one. So it really was just a generalization of, of uh, source coding. So there is no separation between source coding, compression, what I've been calling compression, and network coding. It's the same thing. Network coding is just compression over a network. Source coding up until now was compression over a network. It just happened to be a single hop, single link, or at least single hop network. Okay. Um, so we were very happy when we got to this. Um, and we, you know, we, we did, uh, we, we sort of kept doing these proofs with crayons and we, you know, just squeezed it for everything it was worth. Um, and at that point it was a bit of a choice because we could sort of leave it at this. We were very happy with this, with this result and it, you know, sort of, you get these endorphins from seeing that it's like Sepp and Wolf and, you know, like, okay. Um, and it felt like, okay, that's it, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of done. Um, but then um, we were really trying to see if we could try to put this into something a bit more practical. A lot of hesitation about whether to do that. And uh, I would say that Ralph and I ended up spending a huge amount of coffee uh, hours talking about whether we were going to go in that direction and keep saying that maybe we shouldn't and then ending up doing it anyway. Now remember that we had started from something extremely applied, but this still seemed too far out for us to really try to apply it. But anyway, um, started thinking about whether we could do this in packetized networks. You know, IP packets, what you use to transmit um, most information in the internet. What would it mean for us to do coding? So if you know, I have four packets, I'm now going to choose random coefficients which are going to get modified 
again and again and again without decoding inside the network. Uh, and of course the packet is just you know, a set of bits. I can represent it as a vector in whatever field I wish, pretty much. Uh, you know, why not? So, you know, I'm not expanding the, I'm not, I'm not adding redundancy here, I'm just changing the representation of these four packets into four equations of the same packet. That's basically what the coding does. Um, and then I started working with um, particular uh, one of my students, J. Kumar Rajan, who's now at Qualcomm. And you know, he came up with this very cute way of taking packets inside a coding window. So basically thinking of the TCP window, which is the window where you do congestion control and other things, uh, some reliability mechanisms in, in, in TCP, which is very, you know, probably the most common protocol right now for transport, and saying, well, you know, I, I, can, I can translate these coding coefficients into numbers here, uh, and these are number of bytes up top. Uh, I can tell you how many packets I have, when it starts, when it ends, and let's try that and let's see if it works. And simple modification, it did work. Okay. Um, now, if I look at this random coding, um, first of all, we can see that if I just look at it in a single hop, it does operate like other erasure correcting codes. So I mentioned that you know if a packet is lost, it's an erasure. That's one of the common deleterious effects. Um, so suppose here I had four packets and I'm sending it to three receivers: receiver one, receiver two, receiver three, uh, and let's say I have about 50% packet losses on each of the channels from the sender to each of the receivers and as luck would have it each packet is missing from at least one of the receivers. If I was encoding and I had to do a retransmission TCP would do a retransmission although TCP usually works with a single receiver you know it doesn't work this way with multiple receivers but if we apply the concept of a retransmission like TCP does uh, then what we would have to do is resend all four packets whereas if I just send a random combination by random, I mean again these coefficients are chosen uniformly, independently uh, over whatever field I decided to work in and the field doesn't necessarily have to be very big but certainly has to be bigger than two. Um, then I only need to send two equations. Each of the receivers has four nodes which are the four packets, that is to say the four vectors over whatever field I'm operating in and with only two, trans two extra transmissions I'm able to recover everywhere. Now how is the network coding differently uh, and different in this case from network from the kind of coding which is just doing erasure coding. So if we look at something that is working over a network, say just a three hop network, and I have 10% losses, so you can see that you know my things are getting more and more um, lost as I go through the through the network. Uh, then what I would have is I would have my you know my gray bits on my say my original bits the orange bits are the extra that I have to add on and the red they are the things that are getting hit at each link so let's say you know I had three losses two losses two losses I would say about 10% losses I have to add up front the redundancy for all the losses that are going to occur and of course if I have epsilon losses per link and I have n links then my throughput is going to be 1 minus epsilon the whole thing to the n so the throughput is going down exponentially with the number of links. The minimum cut though is 90% here. And so if I have a network of n links and each one has throughput 1 minus epsilon because it loses epsilon of the packets, then my minimum cut is 1 minus epsilon whether I have one link or a million links. That is to say the throughput should not be going down with L, with the number, with the depth of the network in this case. And what you can show here is if I put just here, let's say 10% upfront redundancy without decoding but only recoding, I'm able to put just enough redundancy for just the next top without ever having to decode. You could say here maybe I could have decoded here, but what if I was splitting the network? What if I had a more complicated topology, I might not be able to decode, I might not have enough equations, right? So suppose here I only had three equations, I couldn't decode, okay? 
And that's actually the things that, that that's the principle that underlies some of the security stuff, which I ended up not putting in for, for length reasons. Okay, so at this point, we, we had become convinced, um, and this particular is some work with uh, my former student, uh, Desmond Lund, that we could, we could do this recoding over a network, and you could show that if you're links were just experiencing losses, not errors, we can talk about, we'll talk about errors later, were only experiencing losses, this was capacity achieving. That is to say, you would always get to the minimum cut, whatever that cut was given the losses that you got. We were very tempted to stop uh, at this point, but we were really hoping that something would happen on the protocol side. It wasn't happening, so we started looking a little bit at protocols, so we jump from coding at this point to trying to incorporate into protocol. Now, at this point, maybe it makes sense to stop and say a little bit why ran random network coding is different from most of the codes that are out there. So I talked about block codes. Um, so let me look here on this axis. What you have is time. And on the horizontal, what you have is I have dark circles whenever a packet, those are information packets, contributes in the linear combinations that I'm considering, contributes to the packet that was sent at that time. Make sense? So uh, at time one there, packets one, two, three, four were linearly mixed and that provided the packet that was transmitted at time one. Um, and this means that the packet that was transmitted did not get in. You know, I don't have partial things. Of course, here they're all mixed. I don't have partial receptions. So if you look at chunk codes, which are basically just slight modifications of block codes like Reed Solomon codes, what you can see is you know the first packet was transmitted, it didn't get through. It was a combination of the first four uncoded packets, and then I transmitted another package of combination of another set of packets, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And if I look at this column here, I need to get four equations before I decode. So when I get down here, I got four equations, four unknowns, I've decoded, okay? So packets one through four are now available. They might have a little bit of a lag here. Uh, and then over here, four packets were available from that in this column of four, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, that's a chunk code. A rateless code, like Luby transform codes, like digital fountain codes, what happens is I wait until I have enough feedback. So I have a, a line of feedback here. Here it just becomes, when it becomes available, there's no feedback, like there isn't in, in uh, block codes. And so I keep transmitting, I keep transmitting, and eventually, I get six equations, six unknowns, I'm done, and I move on to the next set of packets. Okay, so for, at this point, packets one through six are available. I can use a random linear network code here for all of these things. So these combinations, I didn't tell you how they're done, right? I didn't tell you how we combine how those, those different um, blue dots map linearly, right? So there's some coefficients which I didn't tell you what they are. So I could have chosen them randomly or I could have chosen them with uh, some structure to them. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. So people do use, do use a handful of packets to make it simple. And it's a generalization of something like a block code. In a block code, the entire thing would be the chunk. Uh, what this allows, it allows for some partial decoding before you got everything. It's a, that's right. So it's, a, it's kind of a nod towards real time for a block code. I mean, but how small can it be? Instead of overhead issues, why can't you just do it with two packets? So you, you, you could do it with two packets. It's just that you don't have that many choices then for the code. Right? So if you're doing binary, many of these things are in binary, you have two packets, you have you know, P1, P2, P1 plus P2. And so you know, your, your number of choices is, is small, so it's not very good. Whereas you know, if you have a few more packets, you have more choices for what these combinations can be. 
So the choices grow very quickly with the number of packets. So you don't need a huge number of packets to have enough code choices, but two might be a little too small. But four is you're already getting, you know, sort of enough diversity. Otherwise, you know, it's pretty likely you'd get P1 twice, for instance. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, unless you go up in field size, which they don't tend to do. And by the way, weight loss goals also tend to stay binary, and I don't know why. By the, I have no idea. I mean, even low density parity check codes, you know, it took a long time for people to go to a non binary. I'm not quite sure why. I mean, yeah, there are different reasons that people get. Okay. So people have also looked at streaming codes, and so now what you do is you start out by sending just one. Then you send a combination of two. Then you send a combination of three. Uh, so you can see up there, packet one and packet two were available immediately. So that's good for streaming for you know more or less real time. And then you just keep sort of adding more packets. You don't quite know what was received, which is why you keep combining with with more of the old ones. And every so often you sort of go back and run again. You know, and you basically keep running until you kind of hit into a wall and you run back and you run forward. And every time you run forward, you just keep keep accumulating everything you had before just in case because by the way it doesn't help you to have packet four if you didn't have packet three anyway it has to be delivered in order so those are streaming codes and you know um, and you can see here that you're getting stuff earlier than you did with the other two possibilities and now if I have a random code and by the way, so you can, again, do this randomly. You can do it with some structure. It's pretty difficult to do structure there, but there are a few structured codes. Now, what we're going to do here is we're just going to take these packets, and we're going to start coding backwards, coding forwards, and we're going to be going down, basically, a, di a, a rough diagonal of what we're receiving. And what you can see is I get P1 and P2 right away, P3 to P6, which is better than there, and then now I'm getting P7 through P12. Things down here can make up for stuff that happened up there. And that's the big difference now. I no longer need to have everything finished up. I sort of imagine kind of like a, a band diagonal matrix where I'm just using Gaussian elimination to invert it up and so things that happen early on might not be fixed until later on at a time where it doesn't even look like it overlaps with those packets. Okay, um, so using this all of a sudden then we can really do whatever we want. Now why do I need random here? I need random here because you know I had some choices over here you have to do some stuff that's a little bit sophisticated, but not that sophisticated on the second case. This is getting very hard if it's not random. The number of if-then statements that you would need if you want to do something that's structured here that's not random just is insane. Right? Because you can see you're just making it up as you go along. It completely depends on when you get your feedback. So this feedback corresponds to you know feedback from your yellow, feedback from the blue, feedback from the the blue combinations. I mean the light blue, the green, and so on. There's no way. There's no way that you could have all the if-then statements and try to do a structured code. The only thing you can do is to do it randomly. And of course, the nice thing if you do it randomly is that you can keep combining it. Okay. So at that point. Um, it sort of makes sense to try to stick it into an actual protocol and in particular one of the things we did is put it into TCP. So this is work uh, that was done mostly by my colleague Ulrich Spiedel and his student, former student Edward Cocker. Uh, and these are measurements that are being done in some islands in the Pacific where uh, Etwat and Ulrich have been work working with the ISPs there. Um, islands there don't have uh, wireline connectivity, they don't have optical cable, they're not going to get optical cable. It's too far, it's too expensive. Uh, and so basically they rely on satellite communication. So imagine the entire Ireland is just sharing a satellite link, which is expensive and not very reliable. So the little black crosses here correspond to the packet losses that you see on the ordinate over here. The abscissa is days, but it has been going on for a while now. So it's been going on now for almost two years. Uh, this ordinate here is a good put in megabits per second. 
And of course, when the packet losses are high, the throughput goes down. But what you can see here is, you know, so packet losses are low. Both throughputs for TCP and TCP network coding are pretty good. Uh, the TCP with network coding is better. And by the way, you know, there's a big difference between being at one megabit per second and being around six. Right, so you can see the ordinate here. So here you're pretty much around one, two, and here you're above five. So that's a huge difference for service. And if you go to another island, I didn't even know where these places were. I don't know if that makes you feel any better or not, but I, you know, uh, when uh, Edward was telling me where he was going, I would kind of nod and then go on Wikipedia. Um, and <laughs> uh, basically you can see here that they're, they're dazed when um, there would have been no throughput if they weren't coding. So it really is um, very, very applicable. So uh, you can see that here, at least you can complete several of the downloads. At least you have email here versus being dead. And here, at least you're you know, at a couple megabits per second versus really not, not being able to do anything. Um, and so that, that makes a huge difference relative to you know, the, the, the quality of service uh, that you get in these systems. Um, so at that point, um, you know, we've been doing a lot of things in terms of, of applications with Ralph and also with many other people. Um, and it was towards the very end of his life that Ralph started thinking about what this meant relative to physical layer coding. And remember, physical layer coding is where you make up for the errors that are happening in your system. Uh, and, you know, if you're trained as an information theorist, then you've spent a fair amount of your graduate career learning about physical layer codes. I mentioned some of them read Salmon code, convolutional codes, low density parent check codes. And at first, it would seem that, you know, if you're going to combine the network coding with the channel coding, this is the mother load. Uh, and you should be able to just finish your entire career just making up joint physical layer network codes. Okay. What else do you need? Um, and he really had this insight um, that is a separation. So I didn't mention it, but in information theory, there's a separation between channel coding and source coding. So basically, you remember how we first shrunk the data and then we expanded it. There's no benefit in terms of throughput. There may be some simplicity benefits. There's no benefit in terms of throughput to try to combine those two operations. Um, and basically, suppose that I have a memoryless channel. That's to say that I have an input, say, over there at the left, which we generally denote by x, and output at the right, which denote by y. Shannon told us that we could represent that as an error-free link of capacity C, so that we could go from the left to the right. And Ralph's insight was that you could go from the right to the left. Now, at first you may think, why on earth would you take something that has no errors and put in errors? Why would you go backward? But if you think about it, when you have an entire network, in particular if you have feedback, how do you take into account feedback in almost any information theoretic aspect? Basically, you're adapting your transmission. Um, and basically, what came out of this is that there's an equivalence. That is to say, if you give me a network, even though I may not know in general what the capacity region is, I mean, I talked about multicast. Multicast, we know what the capacity region is. If you give me arbitrary connections, arbitrary set of sources, arbitrary set of destinations, you know, source one wants to talk to destination two and three, source two wants to talk to destination three and five, you know, some arbitrary set of demands. In general, that problem is an open problem, even the decidability is currently open. Never mind solving it. I don't know what that region of rates is. But what I can tell you is the following, that if I have no memory in the link itself, then it's not related at all to the probabilistic models that we use for the links. That is to say, there is no reason for me to do joint channel and network code. There's a separation. There is an inherent separation. Okay. 
there's still tons and tons of work out there on doing the source, uh, the, the channel coding along with the, with the, the network coding. But information theoretically, there is no reason. So uh, that's it. There's a separation. Uh, and that means, in general, that um, I don't need to do them together. And at that point, I'm just going to, because I made it too long and then over by three minutes, just say we've been doing quite a bit of commercialization, as I mentioned at the beginning. And, and you're seeing this come up in uh, systems inside uh, Stadia. Uh, you're seeing this come up in uh, systems uh, for distribution of video in, in airplanes. Uh, I showed you, of course, some of the applications in uh, the satellite. Um, and, you know, we put together the intellectual property and started so some companies. Um, and I don't know exactly if there's any moral to the story. <laughs> like I said, it's a little bit more of a, of a retrospective. Uh, certainly, you know, I felt very... Um, indebted to Illinois that they had taken uh, to people who were, as I said, a little quirky uh, and sort of let us loose, um, you know, near the coffee machine. I, uh, Ralph was trying to give up smoking uh, and so he was drinking a lot of coffee and I was trying to give up caffeine because I was pregnant so I was drinking a lot of decaf. Uh, so, you know, we'd have a lot of uh, coffee trips. But, you know, that there was this sort of taking to people who might not have been really not the obvious candidates uh, and, uh, and letting them go at it. So maybe, if anything, that's the moral of the story. Don't, don't, don't always take the obvious candidates. <laughs> give, <laughs> give a chance to the, to the, um, the you know, brilliant but non-traditional uh, background and the traditional background but really working on things that uh, you know uh, belong in uh, maybe tech school um, and that's it okay Thanks. I got to watch them go I wasn't I didn't get to play with you very well <laughs> It, it was amazing. You weren't trying to give anything up. Yeah. That's really <laughs> right. Um, uh, uh, boy, uh, question? Uh, it's, 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 so what's the status of the theory for the multiple source uh, problem for the multiple source and the multiple destination? So if you have multiple sources and a multicast setting, so all the destinations want from the multiple sources, the min cut max flow holds. And actually... Yes, so if all the destinations want the same thing from multiple sources, then as long as all the cuts for, you know, it basically as long as each destination has a minimum cut which corresponds to the, you know, the joint entropy, there are a couple sort of conditional entropies, like Sepp and Wolf, you know, you're just basically using the, the chain rule and entropy, then that, that works. Okay, and, and the random coding works. That's it. So that, that's sufficient. So that's the status. If you have non-multicast um, non, um, settings, there are a few results. Like if you have one receiver that wants a subset and all the others want everything else, then you can also do the random coding. And they have min cut max slow. If every receiver wants something different, just join multicast and also that one's solved. In general, as soon as you get to three levels, uh, then that's not known. So basically three, three different types of demands. So not just, um, so suppose that you have one user that wants everything, another one who wants a superset, and the third one wants a, you know, something even more, that's not solved in general. And, and, it, and, and the decidability itself has so not been shown. Single source, single destination, but multiple flows like that. Single flow, single destination is no problem. But, but multiple. No problem. Multiple sources, multiple destinations, and you're. A single flow, that's no problem. Uh, so you, you, um, I see. So as long as the demand at the receive, like yeah. So, so the latent route result says that even for that, routing cannot. Uh, that, that, that's right. Routing can't do it. Yeah. Um, we can do it in that case. So it changes the. You get the main cut as long as every receiver wants the same thing, or you only have two levels of what can be wanted. So 
if everybody wants this, everybody who wants something wants the same thing, then the Minkat Maxwell holds. If one person wants a subset and the other people want a strict superset, that's fine. If there's just say an intersection, in general, that's not so known. If you're sending to Mink and sending to Sean, something like that, that, that doesn't work. So that's not that's the case that doesn't work, right? That's not known in general. That's right. As a matter of fact, there's a there's a two unicast case. Yeah. So you know, I'm sending to you, uh, and you know, Ken is sending to Sean. That case itself is as difficult as the general case. So, and that was recently shown by Shan, I think Sean Moni. So. Um, so basically, the general case is not is not known. Okay, in general, you can't get away with linear codes for the more general. So you can show cases where you know how to solve it without linear codes, but you can't get away with linear codes. It, it, in practice, you know, I mean, you look at those cases and they you know they you really had to construct them. Yeah. Um. Are they good heuristics? Yeah. Um, so these applications right now really have not been using things other than the the, the random codes. Um, we had some. There are some heuristics actually. We had some work with Ken using. He he, he pointed out that it was like a um, like a CSP. So that you were able to do something, basically setting up a big optimization where you have restricted codes where either you mix or you don't, um, and you're just making a decision as to whether to mix or not. So that was a heuristic, but that was fairly recent. There wasn't that much stuff out there, no. Um, I think there's huge room for improvement and for doing things there, because I mean, the, the, the gains are non-trivial when you do get even some heuristics. Um, but it's, yeah, they're pretty wide open. Yeah. Thank you.